production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, the planning and tensions report is out. Soybean acreage will hit a record. In Southern Gardening, we'll have the new 2015 the Mississippi Medallion Mississippi Award winners. Was developed at suburban in water. the Food Factor, find out a dirty little secret that you can find in most kitchens. In the markets, corn prices turn lower as the government projects more acres and stocks than expected. While feeder cattle placements dip a bit lower than expected in the on-feed report, we'll have analysis. In the feature segment, electronic soil moisture sensors. These sensors, combined with a Mississippi State University management system, are helping farmers to use less irrigation water while increasing yields. What we saw in corn was that uh, it was potential to slightly increase the yield. It wouldn't be much. We're talking about five, six, seven bushels with you know, approximately 47 to 50 percent less water uh, than uh, our tip producers are typically applying. Good day, everyone. I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford. Welcome to Farm Week. The U.S. Department of Agriculture released its 2015 Prospective Plantings Report Tuesday morning. Leighton, U.S. farmers say they will plant a record number of acres to soybeans in 2015. Overall, U.S. corn acreage is expected to be down slightly. The report reflects the intentions of 84,000 growers who were questioned during the first two weeks of March. Leighton will have the market's reactions to the numbers in today's market segment. U.S. farmers indicated they would plant a record 84.6 million acres of soybeans, up 1% from last year. Here in Mississippi, growers said they would plant 2.3 million acres, up 4% from last year. That's an 80,000 acre increase, and if realized, it would be the largest state crop since 1988. Looking at corn, U.S. farmers said they would plant 89.2 million acres, down 2% from last year. That's the lowest national crop since 2010. In Mississippi, farmers said they will increase their plantings 12% to 570,000 acres. With all the rain that's fallen in the Magnolia State, however, that statistic is probably going to decline. U.S. cotton acres expected to fall 13% from last year to just under 10 million acres. In Mississippi, 350,000 acres is predicted off a whopping 18% from last year. If realized, that would be the third lowest acreage crop in Mississippi history. Looking at rice, U.S. rice acreage is placed at 2.92 million acres, off 1% from last year. In Mississippi, acres is expected to increase 10% to 211,000 acres. Turning to peanuts, U.S. acreage is expected to be up 9% to almost 1.5 million acres. In Mississippi, farmers said they would plant 1,000 more acres for a total of 33,000. Sweet potatoes, U.S. acreage is largely unchanged this year compared to last year. Acreage is up just three-tenths of a percent to almost 138,000 acres. Mississippi farmers indicated they would plant 22,000 unchanged from last year. Winter wheat plantings are down. U.S. plantings down 4% to 40.75 million acres. Mississippi plantings are down 25% from last year to 170,000 acres. Before we leave the subject of planting, let's check planting progress in Mississippi. Corn planting was 4% complete as of last Sunday. The five-year average is 39% for this state. Rice planting is barely underway. Soybeans is yet to start. Watermelon planting was 6% as of complete as of Sunday. The five-year average is 20%. Did you know that the kitchen sponge beside the sink is actually one of the dirtiest places in your home? In this week's episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes of the Mississippi State University Extension Service tells us how to handle this dirty little secret in our kitchens. Do you have a sponge or cloth to wipe up spills and clean the sink? 
If you do, you may have a dirty little secret in your kitchen. Kitchen sponges and dishcloths often spread bacteria from one surface to another, resulting in cross-contamination. Rinsing sponges under running water is not going to remove bacteria. Instead, prevent bacteria from growing by squeezing out as much water as possible between uses. This is important because bacteria needs moisture to grow. The easiest method to get rid of bacteria is to just toss out the sponges and get new ones. If you use a dishcloth instead of a sponge, the best way to clean and sanitize it is to wash it in a washing machine using hot water and then thoroughly dry in the dryer. Start each day with a fresh cloth. At the end of the day, put the used dishcloth in the hamper and start cleaning in the morning. Keep your kitchen the center of healthiness in your home. Clean up those dirty little secrets and bacteria lurking in your sponges and dishcloths. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Natasha says another way to get rid of bacteria in sponges is to microwave a damp sponge for 45 seconds to a minute. Are you looking for some great plants that are proven to thrive in Mississippi and Southern Gardens? Well, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bogman tells us about this year's Mississippi Medallion Award winners. It's my pleasure to announce the Mississippi Medallion winners for 2015. The three winners are Delta Jazz Crepe Myrtle, Suburban Nancy Gale Daylily, and Top Pot Scavola. Delta Jazz Crepe Myrtle was developed by personnel at Mississippi State University. The foliage emerges rich raspberry maroon and matures to a dark chocolatey burgundy, making a good background for the clusters of crinkly edged medium pink flowers blooming in mid to late summer. The unique foliage color makes Delta Jazz a good specimen plant. Massing several plants together would be a way to showcase the pink flowers. Suburban Nancy Gale Daylily was developed at Suburban Daylilies in Hattiesburg. This has big red with yellow throated flowers, and I mean big. They're bigger in diameter than my hand. These plants have been growing in trial beds across Mississippi and are very impressive with the flowering performance. Scavola top pot is a herbaceous flowering plant having a sprawling growth out to two feet in diameter. The foliage has coarse tooth edges while the one inch wide fan shaped flowers appear in mass and flower freely from spring into the fall with violet blue, pink, or white petal lobes with yellow throats. This plant with its growth habit is the perfect choice for hanging baskets and container gardening. Established in 1996, the Mississippi Medallion Program was created to highlight ornamental plants that thrive under Mississippi growing conditions. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Now, Leighton, the scavola is surprisingly tolerant of lower temperatures. Trials have shown that these plants can tolerate light frosts and even overnight temperatures down to freezing. And our feature segment today, electronic soil moisture sensors. More Mississippi farmers will be using these this year to grow more bushels while using less water. Time now for the markets with Leighton. And Leighton, you say the month of March ended with a bang. Yes, we had indeed a big pair of USDA reports out on the 31st created some noise and uh, also ahead this week in the markets, some corn acres may yet swing to another crop. A new sawmill is planned for northeast Mississippi and there is a big jump in the amount of beef in coal storage in the U.S. On Tuesday, March 31st, the government estimated more corn acres and stocks than expected. Needless to say, this surprise triggered a negative price response in the market. With these reports now in the rearview mirror, the corn market's attention shifts fully to planting. And for many parts of the Mid-South, corn planting has been subject to weather delays. Market watcher Virgil Robinson says it's flat too wet in the mid to lower south to get corn out on schedule. There are yet, yet acres that can swing from one crop to another. So I don't know that there's any concern yet in the mid to lower south about not being able to plant corn, but certainly two weeks from tonight, 
if they are stymied, that will have an influence on acres. The delay in corn planting in the Mid-South, as well as parts of the Southeast, raises a big question. Will the projected acreage indeed be planted to corn? Or could there be a switch to other crops, such as cotton or even soybeans? Speaking of beans, Tuesday's big reports turned out to be a friendly surprise for this market. The planting estimate was lower than expected for soybeans, and the stocks figure was slightly less than expected. The May contract moved higher in response. We turn to forestry products now. News of a timber company's expansion in northeast Mississippi. Pro South Companies near Boonville says it is adding a sawmill to its operation. The Mississippi Development Authority says the project represents an investment of over two and one half million dollars. 57 new jobs will be created as well. Pro South is currently involved in logging and timber purchasing and operates a wood yard. From timber to the milk parlor now as we look at trivia for this week. Here's our question. How much whole milk does it take to make one pound of butter? Is the answer A, 10 pounds, B, 12 pounds, C, 21 pounds, or D, 25 pounds? You'll find out in just a few more minutes. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Lane Span reports the nation's cattle herd is shrinking and there are fewer cattle on feed replacements. And the hog herd is bigger, and one of the reasons, fewer losses to the PED virus. In the feature segment today, see how electronic moisture sensors are helping Mississippi farmers to save water and produce higher yields. Each year, many Mississippians are seriously injured or killed in farm tractor accidents. Transporting and lifting objects with a front loader requires extreme caution. Unsecured objects can roll or slide down the loader arms and injure the driver. To help prevent injuries, tractors should be equipped with a falling objects protection system. Always secure loads or use a bale spear or straps before lifting objects. A message from the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. The New Albany Home and Garden Show takes place Friday and Saturday, April 10th and 11th. The hours are 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Friday and 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturday. It takes place at the Union County Fairgrounds. Master Naturalist Training is set to start Tuesday, April 21st. It will meet weekly through June 16th. It will take place at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science in Jackson. The program is similar in scope to the Mississippi State University Extension Service Master Gardener Program. You'll learn about Mississippi's flora, insects, birds, and animals. It costs $200 and requires 40 hours of classroom instruction and 40 hours of volunteer service within one year. You need to register by April 14th. Go to masternaturalist.msucares.com for more information. And go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for more information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. We move into the livestock sector now. The most recent cattle on feed report indicates a smaller herd in the United States. Extension economist Brian Williams explained that to me in this recent interview. Brian, did the cattle on feed report have any surprises? There really weren't any surprises in it. Uh, looking at the numbers, uh, on feed, total on feed was down about a half a percent from a year ago, which was just a little bit lower than expected. Um, placements were down 8.1 percent from a year ago, and that was about 1 percent lower than expected. And then marketings were down 2.1 percent, and that was a little bit higher than expected. But all of those numbers were well within the range of, of what the expectations were. So does this reflect continued tight supply of cattle? It does. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing with the lower placements, we're seeing um, the, the, we're, we have a smaller herd. And then on top of that, we're seeing increased heifer retention. Plus, we're seeing heavier cattle going into the feedlot. So it's really, you know, it's, it's really tightening that supply. Would you say this is supportive of prices as far as at the farm gate? Well, overall, the report was, was neutral. It was really, 
it, it wasn't anything that was too unexpected. Um, most analysts knew that we had a tight supply and, and they could see those heavier cattle coming in. So it was, it was fairly neutral for the markets. So producers are seemingly holding back the lighter weight cattle then. Yeah, what, what we're seeing is we have a lot of, of cheap feed out there right now. And so they're trying to feed and, and grow those cattle, both the producers on the, on the uh, cow-calf side, but also our stockers and feedlots, they all have the cheap feed. So they're trying to grow those cattle as much as they can on that cheap feed. Now, separate from the on-feed report, we also, since that report, had a coal storage report, another monthly report. What did that indicate as far as the beef supply? Well, our cold storage, we saw the, the, a big jump in the, in the amount of, of beef in cold storage, 20% jump from a year ago. But what we're seeing there is, um, what we think is happening is there's an increase in imports, so that's kind of adding to our supply. But we're also seeing uh, we can't get the exports out like what we wanted to because there was a strike going on in the West Coast on our ports. So there's kind of some beef backed up there too, it looks like. We end our market segment with an update on the pork sector. Analyst Ted Seifried says the threat of more PED virus in our nation's hogs this year was apparently overstated and that in turn triggered some bad decisions. We really shot, overshot the market with PEDV. We not only overshot on prices, but we also overshot on production, figuring that we were going to have um, this PD virus really thinning out uh, our, our hog herd. Uh, and that never really seemed to be the case, or never really came to fruition. Uh, but not only that, you, you throw the bird flu issues on top of that. Um, a lot of uh, countries are now uh, banning our exports of poultry, uh, turkeys in particular. And the idea there is that with more domestic, or with more domestic supply of poultry, you might see a hit on demand in hogs as well. So for the near term, that's been a bearish story. Now that could turn around at some point. Back to the trivia quiz to wrap things up for this week. And the right answer this week is C. It takes over 21 pounds of whole milk to make one pound of butter. Row crop agriculture is facing a growing problem in Mississippi. Slowly but surely, the Delta is running out of water for use in irrigation. However, an Extension Service sponsored program is turning the tide on this problem. In this week's feature story, we take a look at one water conservation tool being implemented now by Delta farmers that appears to be reducing the amount of irrigation needed to grow a crop while improving producers' profits. The project allowed for what you might call a friendly competition between researcher and farmer as far as who knows when to irrigate best. This story first aired on Farm Week last August. These two soybean fields separated by a farm road represent two different approaches to irrigation. One field is equipped with a scientific tool to determine when it's time to water. In the other, the farmer just uses a traditional method, a visual inspection of soil and crop to decide when to irrigate. These fields at Simmons Planning Company in Arcola are one of the demonstration sites in the Delta for RISER, an acronym for Row Crop Irrigation Science and Extension Research. We feel like water is our most valuable resource. Next to the land that we plant crops on, water is our most valuable resource and we're interested in doing what we can to conserve and properly use that water. For the demonstration project, Bubba Simmons allowed extension irrigation specialist Jason Kruitz to install soil moisture sensors in one field and for Kruitz to make all decisions as far as when to irrigate that field. The sensors were placed at depths of 6, 12, 24, and 36 inches in the soil. But in our extension locations, all of them we set up with about the $500, $550 package where we got the data to the edge of the field on an LCD screen uh, where they can get a real-time reading of the moisture status at those various depths and also a graph of the moisture status over the last several months. Meanwhile, in the adjoining soybean field on the farm, Bubba Simmons called all the shots as far as when to water. He would start the pump on his irrigation well to put water on the field based on a shovel inspection of the soil and the visual condition of the plants. There was no scientific accuracy involved in the decision-making process. Towards the end of the growing season, records indicate the field with the water sensors here had at least two fewer irrigations with no adverse effects on soybean yield. And that was typical across the Delta in the sensor-equipped fields enrolled in the riser program. 
We, we typically start uh, irrigating uh, soybeans just as soon as we see a flower uh, come up. Our producers feel real comfortable about running an irrigation shot down then. Uh, most of our sites, we were able to hold them up a week or two past that. Uh, so that was probably save them irrigation event then. And here at uh, Bubba Simmons Farm, uh, because we had the soil moisture sensors in uh, at this location, we can see the fields coming down. We were really able to judge uh, if we had enough water in that profile to get us able to avoid that last irrigation shot. So in Bubba's fields that he was managing, he sent one more shot of water down, but our sensor data was telling us that we probably had enough moisture to get to or six and a half, which is the point that our soybean specialist in Mississippi wants us to ensure that we have adequate moisture uh, to that point to not cost us any good ball. So again, able to save an irrigation on the front and back side. Northeast of Arcola, near Ruleville, Mississippi, David Arant is another farmer who also enrolled some fields in the riser program. I just kind of wanted to uh, be able to utilize our water more efficiently. I mean, water is a, it's not a, a infinite resource. Once again, soil moisture sensors like this were put into the soil in a field as part of the demonstration project. On this farm, they were placed at depths of 6 inches, 12 inches, and 24 inches. In addition to being connected to an LED screen at the edge of the field for monitoring, David also had a handheld meter to check moisture by walking out into the field where the sensors were buried. David says he saw how the moisture sensors could make a big difference and save him money, especially with his corn crop. I had um, three different pl test plots, if you will, uh, on some, some of my corn fields, ranging from um, kind of really lighter soil all the way to heavy clay. And, um, you know, the moisture meters on the corn, it saved me anywhere from one to two irrigations. On, on one field, I only irrigated it um, twice, you know, versus uh, four times for other fields. And, you know, that's kind of, you know, the moisture meters kind of stagger your, your, um, your irrigation, so you increase the likelihood of catching the rain. You're saving money by not um, having to burn diesel or electricity to, to irrigate. So it's a pretty big savings overall. Extension irrigation specialist Jason Krutz says the moisture sensors not only improve a farmer's profitability, but they do it while maintaining or even improving crop yields, almost guaranteed. What we saw in corn was that uh, it was potential to slightly increase the yield. It wouldn't be much. We're talking about five, six, seven bushels with you know approximately 47 to 50 percent less water uh, than our, our tip producers are typically applying. Producers in the riser program are finding the sensor technology to be not only valuable but very practical and useful on a day-to-day -day basis. There's something that's almost fun to look at and see. Uh, what a rainfall event does to soil moisture, to see what an irrigation event does to soil moisture, and to see what it does at different depths. It's something I check daily. That's the other thing, you know, after say a half inch rain, one thing that I've been amazed about is how um, well the soil responds to even just a half inch rain. You know, um, at the surface it might be uh, bone dry before the rain, then you get a half inch and your, um, your surface looks pretty good, but you're kind of questioning what is it doing, you know, at the six inch depths, 12 inch or 24 inch depths. And that's kind of really where those meters uh, come into play. The positive experience of these and other producers with the moisture sensors is exactly what Jason Kruitz was hoping for, especially when compared to other available irrigation scheduling technologies. And we chose to uh, move out to our extension locations, the soil moisture sensor, because we it's something that a producer can touch, uh, can see, and uh, they're very visual just like we are and, and seem to really respond to the information they glean from that. So uh, seeing the response from our producers in our extension locations and talking with them, how they responded to these soil moisture sensors and the data they can see in real time, I felt like that was going to be the way to get them to adopt this uh, scheduling technology as rapidly as possible. And that's the bottom line goal of the RISER program, to make Mississippi farmers better and more efficient irrigators using moisture sensors or other tools. The end result is less over-irrigation while maintaining adequate soil moisture with no yield loss. From the Mississippi Delta, I'm Leighton Span reporting. And if you're interested in information on using soil moisture sensors, you can watch this story again at our website, also on our Facebook page or on YouTube. We'll also have contact information on our website for Jason Kruitz as well. And that address is farmweek.msucares.com. 
And that program actually is expanding this season. They are adding cooperators who have rice fields as well as a few cotton fields. So continuing to grow and they're actually looking into peanuts now and a year from now they may add some peanut fields as well. I think this is just going to catch on fast. It, it can't help but catch on fast because when you can grow more, use less water, less expense, it's going to do it. I just can't see how it's not going to catch on. Good story, Layton. We are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, we often think of commodity trading as people frantically waving their hands in a trading pit. Two of the nation's biggest exchanges, however, have announced they are ending the open outcry. They are going all electronic. And the food factor, eggs are in the spotlight. And in Southern Gardening, tweener time. That's the time when cool season plants and spring plants show off their best together. And if you'd like further information on a Farm Week story or you want to suggest a story to us, Get in touch. You can find us on Facebook and YouTube. Our mailing address, Farm Week Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi. That's Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi, 39762. Our telephone number is 662-325-2262. You can also get in touch with us through your county office of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. For the rest of the Farm Week crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.